And as you know, PATH itself is an organization that is dedicated itself to increasing the lives of, uh, and bettering the lives of Palestinians, providing them with ba basic rights of freedom and justice, education, and now um, the Palestinian American Bridge is working closely to have a specialty hospital where American doctors and doctors from the West are going to come and help serve that region. Um, as you all know, I don't have to preach to the choir, but one of the most sacred sites in, the, in, in our religion is the Holy Mosque, Al-Aqsa, and Jerusalem, or Al-Quds, is one of the most important cities that we have in our history and in our religion. However, many times, because of polit political appeasement or fear, we're not able to go to these cities. And that in itself is a crime. Uh, so we need to teach our children about the Holy City, about the importance of it. Um, our, our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that that region is so special. And his companion said, why is it so special? And he said that that region is so special that even the angels, they spread their wings over Asham, which is Syria, Palestine, Jordan, that area. And in that area, every inch of that soil of Quds, either a prophet has prayed there or an angel has visited that area. So it's definitely extremely, extremely special to us, uh, just as it is for Jews and just as it is for Christians. So we are trying here to, as the name says, the Palestinian American Bridge, trying to bridge the gap to let American, uh, under, Americans understand, and that's why we have incredible speakers and just wonderful people like Allison Ware, Mr. Grant Smith, and Pamela Olson. Uh, maybe you, could, you guys, if you can just stand up for a minute, I just really want everyone to just give them a real good welcome. Um, these people, as you can see, they're, they're not Palestinian by blood, but the service that they're doing for humanity, not just because it's a Palestinian issue, but they see injustice, they're going out of their way and dedicating their lives and also risking their lives many times to go and promote peace and justice. So we, we would like you to support their organizations, such as If America New. You can go to their website and donate money. They're starting a program where they have a, a billboard right now, which is currently on Richmond, and they're gonna have another one on Westheimer. That's actually with Mr. Bob Carter, but you know we're all together in this. And what, what that billboard talks about how much money the US government gives to Israel every day. It's over $8 million a day that's given. And I think we're gonna have a cowboy just because you know it's rodeo time. And we were we're gonna have a cowboy on the sign that's kind of looking and seeing that wow, you know, every every day we're giving eight million dollars to Israel. Um, and then look at what Israel's doing. So thank you very much for coming and we'll leave the uh, dental jokes and I'll probably will listen at. So you know there's gonna be of course some dental jokes, but we'll we'll save those for later. And all the wife jokes, you know, last time I think I got in a little bit of trouble for the wife jokes, so this time I'm gonna give Secrets of a happy marriage, but we'll try to make it fun in So uh, with that, what we're going to do is first uh, have dinner, and then during the dinner, we're going to have uh, some speakers come up, and then after that, we'll have some question and answers, and then at the end, we have a Palestinian comedian. His name was his name is Amr Zahar. Zahar means poison in Urdu, but of course he's not. I just have to say that out because he's a comedian, so I can say that to you, right? Uh, but that's what it means in Urdu, but he's, I'm sure he's better than poison. I'm sure he's really good. So uh, he's, he's, he's going to come up here and introduce us to Palestinian comedy. He's lived in Palestine, he's traveled to Palestine, and he's a really funny Palestinian. You probably haven't met too many of those, but you know, he's, he's, he's one of them. So inshallah, um, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun today. And I would encourage all of you to make a, a pledge tonight. To, to give some something for Palestine. Try to go visit. As you know, in our religion, if you go pray there, it's one of the three mosques where you get, for if you, if you go pray in, in Al-Aqsa, uh, uh, you get 500 times more reward as praying in any other masjid. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that if you cannot go to Al-Aqsa, he said, try to go as much as you can, but if you cannot go, at least send some oil, meaning send some money, to promote the region, to help the region. And from the beginning of his prophethood, as you know, the Muslims first prayed towards, the, their first qibla was towards Al-Aqsa and Jerusalem, and later they turned. But that's a central point in our, in our religion. 
So that area has to be free and just because it's the Holy Land, not just for the prophets of Islam or the Prophet Muhammad, but for Abraham and all the prophets. So that area has to be an area of peace and justice because that's where people go for spirituality and that's the epicenter of all the religions, especially the monotheistic religion. So we have to promote this in our culture. We have to let other Americans know about what we stand for. As you know, in the Quran, in Table 5, God says that if you kill one person, one soul, it is as if you've killed all of mankind. And if you save one soul, it is as if you've saved all of mankind. So with that, uh, with that background, that's what we would like to do. We want to promote justice. We have nothing against any Jews. There, there's Jews here. We have friends that are Jews. And it's not about Jews, but there's some injustices there that we want people to know about and to promote justice in the region. So thank you all for taking the time out to come out here tonight. And uh, we're, we're going to have a really good evening, inshallah. And it's going to be a lot of fun, too. So thank you very much. Uh, good evening. We're here. Thank you for your evening so far. It is an honor for me to be updating you on the Palestinian American Bridge. It's unbelievable that it has been five years since the inception of this unique organization. And to mark our five year anniversary in this historic year, Palestine made the observer state status in the United Nations with 138 member countries voting for approval. For those of you who are with us for the first time this year, I would like to go through um, a few facts about the Palestinian American Bridge. First, I would like to introduce, uh, introduce our board members, Dr. Akram Mushtaha, co-founder, Dr. Saeed Tepayev, Dr. Hatim Anunu. <laughs> okay, we can go through and let them stand up. Dr. Akram Mushtaha, co-founder, <laughs> Dr. Saeed Tepayev, Dr. Hatim Anunu, Dr. Fetkin Musa, Mr. Abed Rabwan, Mr. Fayez Abu Har, Dr. Ahmed Abu Khmer, and Dr. Kisham Al Mubayyad, who uh, couldn't come tonight. I would also like to introduce the scholarship committee, committee which consists of our board members, uh, Dr. Kisham Al Mubayyad. Dr. Saeed Bitlayib, um, Dr. Hatim Al Nunu, Dr. Ahmed Abu Khmer, and Dr. Akram Mustaha. <laughs> the Palestinian American Bridge is a volunteer organization <laughs> inspired by human values that works to improve the quality of life for Palestinian families and ensures and strives to ensure individual and collective rights and freedom for all Palestinians in the U uh, U.S., Palestine, and the diaspora. It was founded by a group of community volunteers and organizers who believe in the rich Palestinian heritage that is worth not only preserving, but also, uh, also sharing with others in the USA. In February 2010, and in honor of our co-founder, the late Dr. Ibrahim Oweda, PAB established the Dr. Ibrahim Oweda Student Scholarship as an annual academic scholarship for Palestinian students who will attend institutions of higher uh, education in the U.S. Also through the new program with the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, scholarships will be offered uh, to students in Palestine and the diaspora. The Memorandum of Understanding has been signed recently between UNRWA and the PAB, and we are planning to start the program this year, 2013-2014. And this was the memorandum that was signed. The goal of this scholarship, the Dr. Ibrahim Oweda Student Scholarship, is to recognize outstanding students of Palestinian origin and to award them for their achievements. The Dr. Ibrahim Oweda Student Scholarship will extend to many people the same opportunities we have received, granting them access to a wider range of resources and opportunities, while also encouraging each individual to develop a deeply rooted appreciation for their own and others' history and culture. It will provide them with the support necessary for them to advance in their lives and become productive uh, professionals in their local communities. 20 students have received the award during the first three years of this scholarship. 
All the recipients are enrolled in colleges and, university, and universities in the United States, including the following. Uh, the University of Houston, UT Arlington, uh, Houston Baptist University, and Lone Star College. They pursue a diverse selection of degrees like uh, the Bachelor of Sciences, the, the uh, Bachelor of Arts, Associate's degree, and pre-dental with various majors and fields of study including psychology, biochemistry, graphics communication, biology, and more. PAB's next project is in construction of a specialty center in the northern region of Gaza. The center will be home to the visiting professors and consultants during their time as volunteers in Gaza. They will provide services that are currently not available in Gaza and are, are unreachable abroad because of the siege. The center will have the essence of a mini hospital with, with all of the department staff by local clinicians who will continue the care of the patients after the consultants and the physicians have departed. Communication will be maintained with the visiting consultants and physicians via satel uh, satellite communication. Arrangements are being made for the respected volunteer physicians to arrive in Gaza to evaluate the healthcare needs, consult on medical cases, and teach and train the medical students and residents at the medical schools in Gaza. The first two consultants, a pediatric cardiologist and a pediatric neurologist, will arrive in Gaza during the second week of May 2013. If any of you would like to be included in, this, um, in the volunteer list, please um, contact Dr. Akram Mushtaha um, so that we can make the arrangements in a timely manner, keeping in mind that the logistics take quite some time. For, for the first time, PAB will be arranging for, uh, for a two to three week trip to Gaza uh, and the West Bank for high school and college students, providing the logistical arrangements allowed for the trip, including the honor was promised um, to help with the local land transportation. Please contact us via Facebook or email if you are interested in sending your child on this trip. The details will be posted soon. I encourage everyone to consider the benefits of this outstanding opportunity for the youth. Not only will they be enlightened um, with the wonderful culture of Palestine, but they will also be exposed to the challenging um, circumstances, circumstances exposed, um, imposed on the population as a result of the siege. Registration is on a first come first serve basis, <clears throat> with a limited number of people for the first uh, for the first year. Uh, following an evaluation of the first trip, the number of, of spaces might be increased. We have decided that there is no better time than now to start involving our youth in our organization. Therefore, we are also hosting our very first annual leadership program tomorrow at 11 o'clock. If you would like to attend the seminar, please talk to me later tonight. We plan on encouraging our youth to become leaders in this country and increase their confidence level. Stay excited. <laughs> PAB is contacting various medical schools to develop externship opportunities for the Palestinian doctors from Gaza um, and the West Bank. PAB will fully sponsor their three to six month rotation in the highly needed specialties in Palestine. Now, as for how you can contribute, there are several options. Everyone can first uh, help by becoming a PAB member if you're not already. And uh, also there are uh, monetary donations which can be placed in several different ways. On your table you'll find within your scholarship brochure a donation reply with all of our projects listed. Please take a minute to choose the project you would like your money to go to. And for you, our great doctors, who would like to volunteer your time for one to two weeks to help improve the health conditions and fulfill Palestine's medical needs, we encourage you to email Dr. Mushteha to express your interest so we can work on the logistics. Lastly, it would be our pleasure to hear your ideas and receive your feedback. I would like to close by saying that we all need to have persistence, patience, and, pas and passion if we are to succeed. And believe me, the dividends we get from practicing them will be high. And remember that each of us is unique and wonderful in his or her own way in volunteering to help others through PAB and other charity organizations. I would also like to share with you a quote that I found, uh, that I found uh, very interesting and relatable to this event. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. <clears throat> I would also uh, like to thank all of you guys for, um, for coming out tonight, and I would like to thank, uh, thank the board members at the PAB for their continued support to the MSA, Muslim Student Association of Clear Lake High School, and their sponsorship of uh, our annual banquet this year. 
and we look forward to his grant to Smith. Um, and he is a very interesting guy from Minnesota originally, but he has called Washington, D.C. his home for 10 years now. Um, he's the director of the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy, um, which is an independent nonprofit in the U.S., <laughs> and it works on U.S. policy formulation towards the Middle East. He works on research and analysis about trade, law enforcement, and opportunity costs. Um, his works appeared in Antiwar.com, the Financial Times of London, and lots of newspapers, including the Jewish Daily Forward, al the Khalij Times, New York Times, the list goes on and on and on. So without further ado, Mr. Grant Smith. Most of my professional career has been in international research. It's been looking at industry, regulatory environments, new entrants, public policies that affect mainly businesses uh, in such companies as American Express, Yankee Group Research, and a university called CESA. My nonprofit organization does not make policy. Uh, it researches policies and in particular takes an industry approach to seeing which players have the greatest impact on U.S. Middle East policy, uh, their histories, their activities, sometimes legal, sometimes not. Secret agreements, challenges between uh, these organizations and law enforcement, and more important, what kind of actions can be taken to either reform or, in some cases, stop some extremely harmful activities. The output in terms of books have ranged from looking at the neoconservative clean break plan in a book called Neocon Middle East Policy, looking at the impact of visa denial on education, on services trade, uh, looking at some uh, of the impact of trade agreements uh, in particular, illicit activities that contributed to bad trade agreements um, between the United States and the region. And I think the challenge of being able to understand how we came to the current state of affairs where a number of organizations dominate U.S. policy formulation in the region is extremely important. Uh, many of these organizations have repeatedly been challenged on their IRS tax exempt status for Foreign Agent Registration Act violations. And it's important to understand, I think, exactly what people who <coughs> want positive change are up against. And you can do that by taking a quick review of the situation and environment since World War II. This knowledge, I think, is extremely important if you're going to spread the word and take proactive action to change those policies. And what we'll be talking about tomorrow, for those of you who stay on, will be some case studies of real actions that have been taken uh, to realize those changes. I use the word parastable quite a bit when I talk about some of the largest lobbying organizations <laughs> that have an uh, overwhelming impact on U.S. policy. Some organizations that you may have heard of, such as the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, <coughs> can trace their leadership back to the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and international organizations such as the World Zionist Organization and Jewish Agency, which are basically the two fundamental organizations uh, within the uh, plan for a Jewish state in Palestine. The ongoing close coordination of these organizations in the United States and abroad uh, is part of a little known history that I've written exclusively about, or extensively about, not exclusively, uh, in terms of how we came to have such a large unofficial policy making uh, impact in the United States. 
Figures such as David Ben-Gurion, when he first visited the United States, was executive director of the Jewish Agency, a, a, really a government in waiting. And among the first things he did were organize powerful business people to begin sending arms illegally to Palestine. Abraham Feinberg, probably one of the best and biggest cash bundlers and campaign bundlers from LBJ to the Johnson administration, excuse me, from Truman to the LBJ administration, uh, was famous for providing the type of support that could win uh, a campaign or break a politician. And so I think understanding the, um, the impact that some of these international ties have had on US policymaking is primordial. And what I'd like to talk about for the first few minutes is the bad news. The bad news about how we came to a position today where US presidents can't even open uh, certain areas for debates because of decisions made in the past. One of the most influential policymakers in the United States was Rudolf Sonnenborn, who met with David Ben-Gurion on a fateful day in July 1945 and began an archipelago of smuggling fronts uh, across the United States under the auspices of being charitable relief organizations for displaced persons after World War II. But it wasn't about that. It was about gathering ammunition, tanks, guns, putting together blockade running ships, and a host of organizations either designed to look like businesses or nonprofits, but which were in the uh, business of shipping guns and explosives purchased for pennies on the dollar to be shipped overseas to fight for independence. One of the most interesting was certainly Palestine Vocational Service, which stole the entire chap chaplain's list from World War II to begin uh, combing through it to see if uh, Jewish volunteers could be found to fight in Palestine for the upcoming War of Independence. The FBI became interested in some of these organizations uh, when it found boxes of explosives falling on the New York piers uh, in uh, crates labeled as machinery or uh, clothing, creating a danger, obviously, for the dock workers, but also allowing them to trace back many of the front companies to the parastatal organizations, the Jewish Agency, the World Zionist Organization, and serious investigations were made into why they were violating the Arms Export Control Act, why they were violating the Neutrality Act, why they were undermining US foreign policy. But of course, none of this ever led to anything. There were only, in the history of prosecutions of very small people who were ever arrested and indicted. Uh, one of the reasons for that was super lobbyists and extremely active organizations uh, who were able to swarm the Justice Department and put together a war chest of money to influence uh, various politicians that prosecuting would be a bad idea. Uh, in an FBI file declassified in 2010 about super lobbyist Abraham Feinberg, this idea of the war chest and disbursement of funds to quash prosecutions was key. So although many were involved in this um, amateur foreign policy, uh, which was not sanctioned by the United States, very few were ever prosecuted. And the organizations and systems that they created are still with us today in many circumstances, sometimes hidden, Sometimes not. One of the most interesting in the subject of my last book, which is called Divert, traces the activities of some of these smugglers after they left the conventional smuggling business. And this has been the subject of many overseas 
press reports as new documents continue to come out of such clandestine organizations as the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, the Carter Administration Library, and that is nuclear smuggling, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, were people angry about the conventional weapons diversions? Yes. Um, there was a tell-all, boastful book about it that came out in the early 70s, and then it immediately triggered responses from such um, disgruntled lawyers as Norman Dacey, who insisted that there be prosecutions, and uh, told the Justice Department that they had to uphold the law for all uh, or you know, pack their bags and leave. But he was rebuffed by the State Department, by the Justice Department, who let him uh, go and figure out if, uh, by privately funding legally research, if any of the laws uh, were even uh, 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 prosecutable uh, now that the statute of limitations had run out. He also cited ongoing violations of a disclosure act designed to protect Americans called the 1938 Foreign Agents Registration Act, which says if you're bringing in money, if you're bringing in political influence to try and influence uh, the thinking of Americans, you need to disclose that in a public office. But these laws never applied to any of the largest lobbying organizations as they carved out their state in Palestine. In fact, one of the biggest at the time, 30, 300,000 members, the world's, uh, the Zionist Organization of America, uh, actually was ordered to register as a foreign agent seven times, according to documents released last year by the Justice Department. But they finally, according to the career attorneys, got to the AG, the Attorney General, and convinced him not to prosecute. And he actually told them they need not fear prosecution, either now or in the future, no matter what they were involved in. Well, imagine the license that this gave some of these organizations. The Senate also investigated this type of lobbying, this type of tightly coordinated international lobbying, and specifically um, was citing the idea that if such things, such as foreign terrorist attacks, could be allowed to influence US policy making in the region, specifically citing a false flag Israeli attack on US facilities in Egypt, if that's the way that policy was going to be formed in the United States, that we were certainly lost if we couldn't get a handle on this as a country. And so the Senate Foreign Relations Committee investigated foreign agents focus, focusing heavily on parastatal lobbying organizations uh, between Israel and the United States in particular. They raided offices of these large organizations, seized documents, and what did they find out? Well, they didn't find out too much. They asked the IRS, in some cases, why these organizations even had charitable status. They asked them <clears throat> if they could comment on the activities, in particular smuggling, and they never got any answers. One of the organizations that they ordered to register as a foreign agent in the early 60s simply packed its bags, folded it up, and reemerged six weeks later as the organization some of you may know today called the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. The organizations were brilliant at reshuffling their corporate charters even after foreign agent registration orders, this one signed by Robert F. Kennedy, and reemerging. And once again, imagine the power of large lobbying organizations that could, whenever they were caught, doing something that severely impacted policy formulation in the region could simply get off on an excuse. And here's some of the big excuses. When some smuggling organizations connected to the ZOA were caught, they formed a task force, met with the FBI director and said, you know what, we're not involved in anything that's going to hurt the United States. This was Robert Nathan, uh, who was a war uh, economics planner before being tasked to do this. He said, we're not doing anything damaging to the US, but some prominent people in organizations might be hurt if you ever try and crack down on this. 
In the 1938, 1960s, these seven orders to register, the ZOA simply said, well, we're not receiving foreign funding. We might be receiving foreign control, but you can't prosecute us for that. Um, and on and on. Diplomatic immunity for espionage charges that occurred in the mid-80s. Um, what is it? What is it? that allows many of these organizations to flaunt any sort of oversight. Well, we're going to take a look at that. Here's some four different large areas, though, of activities and violations that have relatively little to do with Palestinian concerns, but which are growing in terms of American uh, concerns over this sort of activity as a corruption issue as opposed to a Middle East politics issue. And the first one is certainly the most interesting. In the 1940s, it was all about conventional weapons smuggling. It was all about shipping the implements of war to Palestine to arm a first-class army that could defend this newly created state. By the 1950s, it was all about nuclear materials. Apollo Industries was a $4,000 nuclear fuel reprocessing plant that was formed in Pennsylvania with two Zionist Organization of America executives and one future ADL chair, along with a man with close connections to Israeli intelligence. This single company, over the course of its activities managed to lose more weapons-grade uranium than any other U.S. processing facility. What? This is the stuff that you make nuclear weapons out of. It was visited by some of the most famous spies, uh, including Raphael Eitan, who ran Jonathan Pollard against the United States in the 1980s. FBI testimony that emerged in the 1980s also verified executives of the company loading canisters of HEU, not into crates and labeling them as machinery, but into irradiators, which were supposedly being shipped overseas empty uh, so that people could study radiation in the SORIC facility. As I mentioned, this single facility according to a 2001 audit, lost almost twice as much weapons-grade uranium as any other fuel reprocessing organization in the United States. Uh, the material unaccounted for, while some of these executives associated with the ZOA were in charge, 2% of everything that went through the door. When they left, it fell into industry norms. During the time of the buildup of this foreign arsenal, which the US, by the way, does not acknowledge, can't acknowledge, uh, organizations such as the American Israel Public Affairs Committee in their newsletter were putting out cover information saying this country is too small to ever have a nuclear weapons program. Surely if there are suspicions, they should not be directed toward us. This site is now uh, undergoing a $500 million toxic cleanup because with $4,000 you can't put in the types of safeguards you need to actually have a valid nuclear processing facility. Um, it's an unofficial cancer cluster in which the citizens of this small community have been suing both the subsequent purchasers of the company and the US government for compensation. Let's talk about some other things of vital concern when it comes to the lobbies that have the most influence in US Middle East policy formulation. Uh, Michael Goland was an APAC director who illegally donated $120,000 to a candidate that forced uh, votes to flow from a challenger, Edwin Zhao, to Alan Cranston, who won by the margin of the spoiler votes. Gullen was indicted for conspiracy. 
He even spent some time in jail. But what did he win? Uh, he won for the lobby, the Cranston Amendment, in which U.S. foreign aid to Israel will never sink below the level of interest payments that have to be paid. Um, he managed to get a lot more aid because he was present enough to see in 1984 that Iran was only seven years away from having a nuclear weapons program. He was also leading the fight against trade and arms sales against Arab countries. So was the election fraud worth it? Was it worth shifting policy? The rise of stealth PACs also had a material influence. These political action committees that arose in the 1970s were ways for the lead lobbying organization, APAC, to optimize campaign contributions. When individual donors in this era could no longer max out, they could make donations to political action com uh, committees Many formed with startup kits passed out by APAC. These grew in number over the 1970s and 80s to become a major force in politics. It was completely and totally illegal to coordinate PAC donations to any candidate. But memos leaked to the Washington Post revealed that APAC was doing exactly that. Now, some disgruntled Americans fought this in court for 20 years up to the level of the Supreme Court and lost as election laws slowly changed underneath them. In the 1970s, in order to quash a missile sale to Jordan, APAC director Morris Amite got his hand on missile secrets, used them to quash the deal almost according to the State Department driving Jordan into the hands of the Soviets. It was according to the State Department a major impact on U.S. policy formulation, no prosecutions. Probably one of the biggest myths is that the American business community is behind every Middle East policy, whether it's from uh, arms sales, decisions to go to war, uh, free trade agreements. The free trade agreement, however, that was inked between the United States and Israel was anything but 70 of the organizations that were lobbying on this issue, including Monsanto, said, if we're going to have a free trade agreement with some country, make it a significant large country and make sure that the benefits aren't only one way. The organizations lobbying for a free trade agreement in 1984 and 85 were mainly small organizations, uh, many small traders uh, in Israel. And what happened? In order to take a competitive advantage from the organizations that didn't want the free trade agreement, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee and the Israeli Ministry of Economics uh, managed to acquire the entire classified U.S. Trade Administration document about all of the reasons why these organizations, from pricing to um, market share to production costs, why they were lobbying against this and used it against them in public relations and lobbying. This act of what was investigated as theft of government property and espionage, was it worth it? Well, it turned a fairly even trading relationship of exports and imports into a $10 billion subsidy. It reversed uh, basically uh, a balanced trading relationship and created an imbalanced trading relationship. The equivalent of 120,000 jobs that weren't created in the United States, if you use uh, some of the uh, formulas for calculating that. So there was an impact. It was a negative impact. And finally, in 2005, there was uh, a series of Espionage Act indictments because two APAC employees managed to get classified national defense uh, information and tried to convince Glenn Kessler of the Washington Post that it signified that Iran was attacking the United States in Iraq. The judge made prosecution of this particular 
lobbying initiative very difficult by forcing prosecutors to consider state of mind uh, and other one-time special cases that have never been repeated in courts and the Obama administration quashed the prosecution. Um, the FBI was furious about this, but I think by this time they're finally getting used to the fact that <laughs> if they try to have any sort of accountability for this particular lobbying organization, it's not going to happen. But if you look at that instance, and this is, we're getting into the positive thing now. If you look at that instance of accountability, where there was at least an indictment for each of the executives involved, it represents kind of the first time a major propaganda campaign has been reversed positively for all Americans. Uh, again, during the Levon affair, that was covered up for decades. The Israeli nuclear weapons program, still a secret in the US administrations. Uh, other instances, such as a great deal of the debunked propaganda that was used to convince America to invade Iraq. But in this one case, the idea that Iran attacked the United States, it didn't work. Now there's been, uh, according to some of the seized documents from these 1960s investigations, a very skillful effort by parastatal lobbies to cultivate editors, to buy big print runs, to promote Judy Miller type journalism, which means uh, journalism that's mainly propaganda, uh, and pitch ideas. In fact, some of the best policy magazines have been wholly owned subsidiaries of various lobbying organizations. But that's changing, and that's changing very, very quickly. The era of limited outlets that will not let uh, Americans be more fully informed about what's really going on is coming to an end. And I think uh, some people, according to polls, think that end isn't coming soon enough. About the time Americans were beginning to receive better reporting about the lack uh, of evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, Americans who reported that they didn't have very much confidence in mainstream or mass media for reporting became the dominant view. It reversed until currently it's about 60%. If you look at public awareness of some of these corruption events that I'm mentioning, the time between the incident and broad public knowledge of what happened has been declining. For the 1940s arms smuggling, information about that didn't come out until decades later. For this most recent incident, however, the news is almost immediate. And a lot of that is due to alternative journalism and, frankly, uh, new alternative uh, news outlets. Some of the people who are now reporting about U.S. Middle East policy don't have a mainstream media background, but they have huge followings. They develop a following through Twitter, through various blogs, because they have a uniquely informed opinion and experience, they're beginning to reverse the dominance of major media. And you can see this with some harsh critics, such as Glenn Greenwald, who is one of the harshest critics of uh, Middle East policy, one of the harshest analysts, having many more followers for his periodic broadcasts of uh, information and ties to his news articles than a pundit such as Jeffrey Goldberg who meets with presidents and prime ministers but is not that widely respected uh, among more serious scholars. Core lo uh, lobbying objectives today, I think, continue to be um, drivers of U.S. policy. It's not about guns and money. It's about coordinating the campaign finance system, 
suppressing debate in key areas, uh, providing a cover for expansion, shaping policy, and minimizing its own role by claiming broad public support and diminishing the idea that there's an international connection. But the brand is failing. Increasing numbers of the public think the brand of a lot of the key policy organizations like APAC, like ZOA, is we're here to suborn your politicians to your taxes and transfer out your revenues. That's not the image they want, obviously. The image they want are the last three points, that only US and Israeli interests are the same, that it's the only democracy, and that it's almost always in danger. But people aren't buying it anymore. Why? According to a Chicago Council survey of American public opinion, which is representative of some 94% of households, they've learned enough not to want to take sides anymore. The number who want to take neither side is now well in excess of 60%, according to a poll of which side do you take in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Neither side. That's now the dominant view, and it's extremely tied to a shift in information availability. Another poll number from the Chicago Council Survey of American Public Opinion. Where should the United States be putting its foreign aid budget? The number of Americans who say that it should be increased, the amount of aid to Israel, is falling. It's fallen steadily since 2002. The number of Americans who think that it should be decreased or stopped altogether, 41%. And if you take the number of Americans who either want to keep it the same or decrease it, they're now in the majority, according to this poll. Almost 90% don't want to see this particular aid increase. But the interesting thing is what impact is that having on policy? As you might have guessed, the trend of USA to Israel since the 1940s to the present day has been one way, and that's to give more aid every single year. So how long can this schism between public opinion and what's actually being done endure? And what's behind it? U.S. military aid to Israel in 2012 and 2013 will approach unprecedented levels. But it's coming at a cost. If you look at what's probably the key organization, the key non-governmental organization that measures perceptions of corruption, since the beginning uh, of 2000, the United States standing has been going the wrong way. This is an index where you want to be the lowest on the public perception of corruption scale. You don't want the United States, in this case, to be increasing two and three steps. But that's what's happening. And I think it's legitimate to perhaps think that's linked to the schism between what's actually happening in public policy and what the American people are asking for. Uh, here's one interesting example. The Jewish agency, which was at the heart of a lot of this smuggling that took place back in the early 1940s, is still uh, around. And not only that, it's instead of receiving donations, it's receiving your tax dollars. 25 million a year since 1973 to 91, <clears throat> 2000 to 2013, 41 million a year. Uh, this organization has hosted and funded key pundits who have produced very little in the way of progress in Middle East negotiations, such as Dennis Ross, who is in charge of a Jewish agency think tank. Its American section was shut down after questionable uh, receipts of uh, overseas funding and misappropriation uh, 
It was at the heart of the 60s investigation of propaganda funding in the United States. It's now lobbying for the release of Jonathan Pollard, uh, Israel's top spy. In other words, American taxpayers are now funding for lobbying of themselves rather than have it simply be done privately. And so challenging this sort of behavior uh, is not, as I mentioned before, uh, a job for small numbers of interest groups. It's going to take a coalition effort. And there have been many failures in the past to deal with this sort of thing, such as just not much information, lack of coordination, no stamina, wrong leaders, wrong partners, uh, people being uh, under the assumption of good faith that they could simply take these issues, such as Norman Vasey, to the Justice Department and say, do something, and finding out that they're not going to do something. And so what we'll be doing tomorrow is looking at some case studies about bypass, bypass the media, spreading the word, building coalitions on the internet, and how self-interest will now drive a more positive outlook for Palestinian issues than a narrower approach. Because it's come down to that. Americans are also being victimized. And so I'm going to skip ahead. I'm just going to tantalize you with some of these case studies and skip ahead to the point. The point is overlapping concerns. If you think of how traditionally Palestinian issues have been framed, it's been about ongoing property and resource theft. It's been about being on the receiving end of warfare. It's been about constant propagandizing. If you look at concerned American issues, it's pretty much linked on a bigger scale. Endemic misuse of US taxpayer funding, regulatory capture, where you can't get redress for grievances like we're supposed to, um, propaganda that clouds the vision of politicians and the public alike, secrecy, declining accountability. The overlapping concerns mean that there's a vast um, potential now for broadening the coalition of groups that's seeking a more just and reasonable regional policy. And that is not just about uh, redress of grievances in the region, it's about respect for property rights, respect for sovereignty, not privatizing foreign policy, taxation and representation, not funding, foreign lobbying, rule of law, transparency. The opponents, obviously, of transparency and good government have been, in this domain, Israel and some of its parastatal lobbying organizations. Not the only ones, but they've certainly been at the lead. And so, with that, I'd like to uh, insist that those of you who want to find out about how to do online activism that gets results in building coalitions and in getting out the message, Come to lunch tomorrow.